Okay. Hey, everybody. Hope you're all enjoying Cloud Native Security Day so far. My name is John Kinsella. I'm Chief Architect at Accurix. Going to talk about a project I've been working on for a while. Um, th this is a more of a proposal in a talk form uh, bound around security nutrition labels for cloud native projects, open source projects in general. So the idea here, this originally came to me probably close to a year ago uh, from an academic, academic paper uh, that was talking about uh, nutrition labels for privacy. Um, I think we covered this at some point, Application Security Weekly, or I'm co-host. I can't find a link to it, so unfortunately I don't have it in the notes. Uh, everything else I'm talking about is referenced in, a, we've got a, a page at the back of the slide deck here, which, talk, which has all those links. But, um, so that's where this came from. Uh, and, and let's sort of dive in and, and talk through. So the point of this really is, is I want to start a conversation here. This is being recorded a month before you guys see this, so I'm still working on this. I'm hoping to have a uh, proposal into SIG Security. Uh, stuff you're going to be seeing here is on a GitHub account, so I'll, I'll probably be pasting this in um, either while you guys are watching this or during the Q&A at the end. Um, and and uh, enjoy, and, and I'm, I'll probably say it many times, but I'm, I'm looking for feedback, so uh, give us what you got. So the Food and Drug Administration, FDA in the United States, uh, they consider this thing, which I suspect all of us have seen, uh, the nutrition facts label to be one of the uh, most widely known graphics in the world. Uh, you know, we see it, we sort of know what's on there. It's getting better over time. I'll talk a little bit about the history, but the idea is how do I bring something like this to security? Um, and, and really in a, uh, you know, it's obviously not going to be mandated by law. So how do we do this in a, uh, a friendly way that allows people to, to have a sense of, of what they're consuming? Uh, and that, that's the core of what's going on here. So the uh, nutrition laws first came around uh, early 1900s. I want to say 1907 is when FDA was formed, uh, again, in the US. I, I, this has now grown. You know, there's, These type of rules or are, are labels are all around the world in one form or another. Uh, but really what's interesting is their, their uh, creation came from packaged goods, packaged foods. And what happened is as people started, vendors started selling packaged goods in, in that manner, you know, there's always going to be looking for someone to make a few more cents. So I started trying to figure out how do we make that package either a little bit smaller, but look like it has the same amount of stuff in it, or maybe use a cheaper ingredient, or maybe use a more dangerous ingre ingredients. So these are the type of things people were doing. And, you know, people probably started dying uh, or they weren't getting their money's worth. And the government said that ain't that cool. So um, the law started getting created. And I don't know, maybe there, there was some sort of tomfoolery and another company was saying, hey, we, let's let's get the other guys, so let's get some laws. I'm not sure the exact creation, but um, I spent about a day digging into this stuff and Fox pulling down into it and, and it's, let, let's keep going. Um, in the 70s, uh, the first versions of the nutrition labels were actually mandated uh, from a point of view of if you were making health claims on the package. So when these aren't mandated around the world is, is varies, but you know, in the U.S. is once you started saying, hey, this makes your son healthier or stronger or taller, uh, that's the type of thing which people start regulating. Uh, if you mention something like baby food or what's in your baby food, that's when people get really nervous. The mothers out there probably listening to this go already sort of that, you know, don't don't mess with my little one. Um, and then since then, every decade or so, uh, we've had some amount of tuning and tweaking going on is this type of document. Uh, and that's usually based off science, uh, you know, as either our scientific understanding of what we're consuming gets better, or as the bad guys use science to figure out a cheap way of getting something into your goods. Here we are. So this is now going on over to the digital side, right? We've all heard about what Apple's up to. I believe Google's doing some of this stuff as well. This is the uh, a privacy label for um, uh, Google Photos. Uh, doing a lot of linking but you know this is just being shown to sort of sort of that we went from uh food labels to digital labels from a privacy point of view so let's think about what can we do with this for security um and obviously again you know we don't have the um chokehold of a government we don't have the chokehold of apple's app store but what can we do in a way which still allows our users to have a little more trust in us so from my own personal point of view, I thought of this from two aspects. Uh, one of those is when I'm first looking at a project, uh, what does it do, right? Is, is this 
if I install this, is it going to be taking over my cluster or is it going to be formatting my disk or is it um, uploading data or just generally what, what's this thing doing that I just downloaded? I can't code review everything. Um, if it's a big famous project that has, you know, 10,000 stars on GitHub, okay, we got a little more trust in it. Um, probably as I think about that, I'm aiming at this more towards the sandbox and the, um, the middle step whose name I'm forgetting uh, in the, the CNCF process. Those are the guys who are, we're trying to figure out how do we get them help so their project get more adapt adoption. Uh, and then the second aspect is installation help. Uh, this is a big one to me, probably not so much um, with an off the shelf thing you just download and run like a brew install, but something that's a little more complex, like um, I'm not gonna name names, but you download the thing, you compile it, you install it, and then the configuration starts. And you do one configuration, you need to do another configuration, then you need to create usernames, you need to create roles, and the next, it's, at some point in there, you're so far in that you don't want to back up and give up because you've already committed this time to it. But you're like, I wish I knew this the beginning before I got started, I would have gone and just bought something, right? So that's, that's sort of what I'm looking for here is how can we help provide transparency in these type of things? This is really not about, uh, you know, the whole red, green, blue, security, bad, don't use type thing, right? This is more uh, advisory, uh, not looking to admonish, right? We're open source, we're not trying to spank people. We're trying to get people to do the right thing, uh, to increase trust. Uh, and I think what's an interesting side effect of something like this, this is sort of a little bit like a self-assessment. Um, and depending on where it goes, this might get linked into the self-assessments. So I can see that as a possibility. Uh, but I think as a application developer or as a project is realizing, hey, maybe I want to put a security label or a badge on my on my project on GitHub. Um, as they start going through and looking at all those tick boxes that they could be able to do or the YAML will show in a few minutes, that might make them realize, oh, hey, I could do this really quickly and become that little bit better on my badge. Um, maybe they knew about it and they just hadn't got to it yet, or maybe they hadn't even thought about it. So I think from either aspect, uh, I, I think there's some benefits there to people doing that. And as fun as that is to talk about those labels, um, let, let's be honest here, right? If, if most of us walk into a store in the morning, um, say it's lunchtime and we're hungry, uh, we're not going to be like this lady here just going down the aisle, picking up every box and looking and reading what's on the back of it. Uh, it's a lot more, uh, at least for me over, you know, <laughs> beside the last year of COVID, uh, it's lunchtime. I go into a store, I grab something, I give somebody money and I want to shove it in my face and go, right? I'm not looking at detail. We, we will in some cases, if we have a, a dietary need or um, we're buying something for a loved one and we're really careful about what they're, they're consuming are some use cases like that. But what I try to say is, is, you know, we're looking at the front of these packages on the shelves. And that's where um, industry came up with the system of what they call a front of package label. And, you know, let's, let's get my ugly mug out of the way here. Um, it, depending on the country or, you know, obviously we have different languages on here. Um, there's different ways, p different organizations have gone about doing this. Sometimes it's for uh, adult health. Uh, sometimes it's for weight watching. Sometimes it's, you know, um, let's, I think it's Brazil that's actually doing some of this for, um, trying to minimize obesity in the country. Uh, but one way or another, we want to put a simpler label on the front that isn't, uh, this is 39% of your recommended daily allowance. It's like, hey, from a quick glance, should I be eating this? Should I be eating a lot of this? Uh, it's not, this is poison, don't touch it. It's more around, hey, maybe you don't need five Krispy Kremes, right? So it's a little more guidance. And this is sort of, a, when you think about it, this is a lot like our, our badges we have on modern day projects on, on, on GitHub, right? Uh, so I, I don't have, I haven't boiled down what I'm looking at when I'm researching into something quite this beautifully simple. That's what I'd love to get to. Uh, you know, most of those badges are pretty small. I'm not sure how much information I, I could fit into them. Maybe it'd just be a link out somewhere else, but that'd be a nice goal to get to, I think, for this. Um, so uh, the graphic designers and audience, uh, I'll, I'll show my skills a little bit, but I'm still looking for help on that. Uh, so brainstorming what this actually looks like or what we could put into this uh, contents of label. So in, in you know, the, the top few are pretty understandable. Uh, network connectivity, is this thing opening up a listener on the network? Uh, and you know, actually, when you think about it, 
another use for uh, um, a nutrition label like this, it, it, if someone's claiming that they're not doing that and then suddenly an application is doing that, um, I don't want to say that's a sign of tampering, but that would sort of give you uh, an, an extra um, an extra bit of information during a investigation. So I think there's some value there for that as I as, as we go through this. Um, root privileges are they needed? Uh, you know, do I need to run this with a um, cluster cluster admin rule binding? Uh, the credential aspect is is pretty interesting. We're seeing more and more applications now that uh, they want an API key to go and connect to GitHub. Atlantis comes to mind. I've been working on that recently, or um, you know maybe it needs like Terraform once your your um, credentials be able to go ahead and spin up uh, um, um, VMs on on Azure, or you know there's all sorts of different use cases there around that. But that's something that, uh, especially in enterprise world, uh, when someone says, "Oh, I need," you know, I think for Azure in particular, you can't just use a read-only account to look at your your AKS clusters, you need to have admin rights to get the keys to get into them. Uh, a self-respecting uh, enterprise with a modern security policy isn't just going to do that automatically. So if they knew something about that up front, as one example, that that that's something that they want to understand what they're getting into. Uh, we're all thinking about software supply chain. So I threw the few points in around that here. Uh, I think that's, again, you know, transparency. If we can help these people do this or understand this, in that sort of you know checkbox type format, I think this will be handy. Um, and then the next group are a little more advanced, a little more mature. So I, I've, I'm, we've got three examples here coming up. One's a sandbox, one's one of my own applications or, or Acrix's applications, and then one's um, a very mature application. So we'll see the difference between those three, how they show off in something like this. Do you have an architectural diagram? How about a threat model? So these would be more like just hate traps, right? Uh, um, if you've done a self-assessment questionnaire, if you are um, working on graduating from CNCF, uh, from the sandbox, let's link out to that so people can sort of see very quickly without, a lot of this also is, a lot of this information is available already, but how can we make this um, sort of one-stop shop to get as bunch of this type of data so people can actually, you know, I know if I go to the nutrition label, I can find, if they have a threat model, I could find it there and just go and review it and keep going. Or I can look at their self-assessment questionnaire from that nice, easy place. We're seeing more of the, um, the mature projects starting to do third-party reviews. Kubernetes has been doing it for a while. Uh, Linkerd, we've got in here, they've been doing it. Um, security contacts, again, you know, this is something that's fairly basic, but uh, I'll point at myself, not all projects have it. Uh, and then a security page. Do you have sort of a single place where people can go and find out more detail about the stuff we're talking about. Um, I'll, I'll try to not bob my head around. I know this camera's trying to follow me, so I hope that's not driving people nuts. But keep going. Um, so three examples. Uh, YAML. Uh, you know, I figured we're always doing YAML already for most of the stuff we're doing around here. Let's put this into a YAML format as well. Uh, and to sort of grab a pointer and go through here. Starts off fairly basic. So this is for a, um, a CNCF sandbox, sandbox project called uh, Telepresence. Some of you may have heard of it. Long story short, it allows, uh, sets up a proxy between your desktop and a Kubernetes cluster so you can do remote um, uh, um, development. Uh, you know, so uh, application name, source code URL, so people can go and find that if they're not there already. Uh, is it sending on the network? Is it receiving on the network? Is it starting a listener, as I mentioned before? What port? So this is where I'd love to put as much as I can into a, a defined language. But I think for something like this, there's going to be a lot of just strings, right? So um, a proxy is going to be listening on whatever port that somebody needs it on. Um, another example down here under privileges, uh, what type of credentials are required? Uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, this thing needs it. This thing consumes the the privileges of the person running that application from their desktop. There's a, a minimum set of requirements, but that's what they're consuming. What the application is consuming doesn't need root, doesn't need privileges. So you know, looking pretty good here so far. Um, some of their commits are signed, not quite all of them. And then same with builds. So I think any builds nowadays that goes onto uh, Homebrew has to uh, be signed, and we're seeing more and more of that type of thing. Excuse me. Um, the interesting one here on 
the Git commits, and I'm not sure. I haven't been watching what the the um, software supply chain guys have been doing in detail. But from a point of view of very few projects have been signing their commits since day one. So do we say, hey, the last three releases have had their all their commits signed? Maybe all their commits in the last six months have been signed. Is it the last hundred commits have been signed? What type of verbiage could we put in there, or language could we put in there that that makes that um, meaningful? but not a, a very black and white yes, no, that most companies or most projects couldn't actually respond to. So moving forward to example number two, this is for TerraScan. This is an AccuRx application open source. Uh, and really it's an ISC application that can scan Kubernetes and uh, customize and Helm and um, uh, Terraform. Uh, but again, so sort of going through here, he's able to you know get the URL for source. Um, he's listens, he, excuse me, he sends on the network by default, he down, you know, he sends out a request to, to get to a GitHub to do a pull uh, for his rules. Uh, listening is optional, so it can run as a server or by the time this is published as a admission controller, uh, but by default it doesn't. So listening that is optional. I think that's okay to do. Uh, listens on a particular port, <clears throat> unless that's overridden. Uh, most of the rest is pretty clean. Again, recent Git commits have been signed. I've been pushing for that. Uh, our builds are signed, and we actually have an architecture diagram, so we're able to get you know one point there on the the advanced things. I don't have a contact for security. It's something we need to do, and hopefully by the time this is published. Um, so moving towards something a little more advanced, still advanced still here. So this is a Linkerd <clears throat> graduated project. Um, and again, it, it starts off sort of the same, you know, send and receive and, and these type of things. He's doing TLS by default. Uh, they're, they're really trying to do security by, secure by default. So they're, um, they're able to check boxes like this a lot easier. So that's gonna look better in a, in a, a diagram, right? In a um, nutrition label. Again, it's a proxy type application. So the ports listening on it varies. Uh, it does need cluster roles. Uh, you know, you, I think you can run Linkerd and maybe just a single, um, namespace, I think. So you might not have to have a complete cluster role binding, but really if you want to do anything useful with it, I think that's where you're going to go. Uh, again, signed git commits, signed builds. And then as we come down into the maturity stuff, you're seeing more stuff down here. So they've got a security page, they've got their third party audit, they've got their architecture diagram, they've got their security contact. So, you know, we're filling up more on my screen here. Uh, there, there's more stuff that we could put into these uh, slides, some of it I haven't dreamed up yet, some of them I'm trying to keep, you know, this readable. So bear with me. Uh, but that's sort of an example of looking at three different, app three different applications. How would they, how would they be, um, how would you communicate in a, um, a YAML form what their security um, facts, their nutrition facts are. So that's sort of thoughts on that. How, so then, you know, let's go from this into a graphic format. What would that look like if we came back to our initial slide. So this is something I mocked up for Linkerd. Um, you know, it's it's easy, it's simple. It's it, not too much for me to talk to here, right? It, it's when you take that and sort of break it down into a consumable, visually consumable format, it, it's, it's um, I sort of like this, I have to say. So uh, a few check boxes that they're doing industry standards, maybe not everything. I'm not sure if I'd call variable ports industry standards. So I left that off, um, same for the cluster role binding. Um, but a brief description of what they're talking about, the name of the project, and then, you know, I, the all important, uh, who do we contact if there's a problem? Um, and maybe there's a few more things I should put in here. I, I'm not sure about putting in links for the security pages. I guess it could be, or maybe just a link rendered in HTML. So, um, we'll see what we do around that. So, um, this is what I've been working with. This is the, the idea I've been playing with. I'm looking for any feedback. Anybody want to work, work with me on this? As I mentioned, I'm hoping to have this in as a um, proposal into SIG security. Um, and we'll see where it goes from there. Uh, but I appreciate your time. I think we've got about 10 minutes left for questions. Um, can feel free to reach out to me on, on CNCF Slack, I'm JLK, or on Twitter at your handle there, uh, John L. Kinsella. Uh, thanks, everybody. I appreciate your time. Take care.